Now, Sarah, so we're going to just switch our brains a little bit and think about Sarah. It is quite early in the morning to be thinking, and this is slightly more complicated. So she is 17 and she doesn't, she has delayed menarche, all right? So we've said 15 and you should be thinking about what's going on. So she's lean and fit. She hasn't had any weight loss. You can see she's a pretty small girl. Her general health is good because, of course, you know, what I haven't uh, stated is there are a lot of um, general health conditions that are obviously going to affect her menstruation and hormones. She's never used a birth control pill. She's had some tests from her GP. I'll come back to those. When you look at her, you've not only thought about the periods, but you have thought about her pubertal status. And she didn't say to you a lot about it. She's a little bit embarrassed, and let's say you're a male GP. She hasn't wanted to mention that there isn't much in the way of breast development. And maybe in her family, there isn't much in the way of breast development. But in fact, she has adrenarche, so she has secondary sex here, but she has no breast budding. So remember we said the, the mean age of breast budding is 9.9 .9 years, just under 10, and it's delayed by 13. So she's very delayed. That is a very important finding. You've tested her sense of smell in case you were going to make a clever diagnosis of Kalman syndrome or idiopathic hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. You've thought about PCOS. So PCOS could certainly give you delayed period, but it would not give you delayed puberty, would it? Not with all that estrogen around. And you've looked at her BMI and you've thought about hypothalamic amenorrhea with this history. And certainly, hypothalamic amenorrhea in its extreme can delay puberty as well as periods. You think of watching the um, the uh, Olympic Games and you think about watching those gymnasts and, and in theory they have to be over 16 to compete. And you can see that many of them look prepubertal. So they've either started and regressed or they haven't started. So she's lean, 55 kilograms. You've got a very normal testosterone. You've got a low LH and actually a relatively low FSH. But be aware that the lab might well report that as normal. And then you have done a pelvic ultrasound and she's got very small ovaries. In this setting, the radiologist may find it difficult to even see the ovaries. Doesn't mean they're not there. They, they haven't had any stimulation, so they're small. She's got a uterus, so she doesn't have Mayer Rogatansky, and her endometrium is very thin at one millimeter, suggesting for whatever reason she's not getting estrogen. Make sense? Okay. So, what we have here is a normal prolactin. We have low gonadotrophins, low estrogen state, delayed puberty. So we know that she's got gonadotrophin deficiency. And what we don't know is the level that is. Is that the pituitary? Is it the hypothalamus? Or is, is it the stimuli? Is it the energy stimuli that she's getting from being fit and perhaps not eating very well before that? So she needs a bit more of a workup. And just to run through, do you all know how to do a pituitary function workup, which again is just a simple blood test? So an early morning blood test because you want the cortisol to be done at or before 8 o'clock in the morning. And certainly in Auckland, that's a very busy time for the lab. So the patient rocks up at about quarter past 8, they get in a queue, and the blood test gets done at 9 o'clock. And because your ACTH secretion, does anyone know when it's highest? And therefore your cortisol levels, when are they highest during the day? Anyone know that? First thing in the morning, yeah. And so there's no point measuring a cortisol at lunchtime or in the afternoon because we don't have any cortisol that's measurable then. That's why we all feel blah. At, you know, towards the end of the day, you'll be all feeling a bit tired. And, and that's because our cortisol levels are low. So if you're trying to distinguish normal um, from low, you have to do it at a time where it's high. So, the, you know, as soon as the lab opens, get the patient there and look at the timing. It's very annoying in Auckland. They don't give you the time of the cortisol, so you often have to ring the lab and check. And basically anything over 200 in our lab is probably normal. You're going to measure an IGF-1 to be sure she doesn't have a functioning, um, she doesn't have growth hormone hypersecretion, her thyroid function because she could have secondary hypothyroidism, her prolactin, her electrolytes for diabetes insipidus, um, and we've already done her gonadotrophin. So we're looking for just gonadotrophin deficiency or a more generalized picture. Okay, and that's a simple thing, and again, that can be done in the primary care setting. And then I think in this setting, you have to know what the anatomy of this area is. And when we all used to do CTs of the area, we, it was probably a little bit insensitive, that test, but we didn't overdiagnose things. So what happens now that we do MRI? Good morning. We're just sort of midway through our um, amenorrhea talk. 
Um, so, um, what happens is that we often find things that may not be clinically relevant. So one in four, one in five patients will have a lesion in the pituitary that's under five millimetres, and we would call that potentially an incidentaloma. So we're a little bit stuck here because we don't know if that's relevant to the lack of gonadotrophins or that's just her and she's always had it. All right, so that's one of the problems with doing slightly more sensitive um, imaging. All right, so let's look at her tests again. So we're, we're looking at a girl who's 17 who has not only delayed menarche, but very importantly has no signs of puberty. So she has delayed puberty. We've said that normal puberty, the si it starts the mean age, median age for it to start in New Zealand is just under 10, should be breast budding and periods. 98% um, of girls will have had periods by the age of 15. So at 17 to have no signs of puberty and no, no periods is very delayed. So we look at her pituitary function, she's got a really normal cortisol, she's got normal growth hormone access, normal thyroid function, normal prolactin, so it's not a prolactinoma. Again, the very suppressed gonadotrophins, very low estrogen level. Okay, so she's got gonadotrophin deficiency, isolated gonadotrophin deficiency, and she's got a tiny lesion in her pituitary which may or may not be of relevance. And as it's the real world, I put that in just to be slightly more annoying. So here's, this is what we think is going on. Um, isolated gonadotrophin deficiency, and we suspect that the, this is an incidentaloma, but what we'd do is follow that up with another imaging, say in 12 months time, to just make sure that's stable in terms of size. Could she be a girl that's got functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, you know, as in a gymnast or a ballet dancer? And she is small and she is light, and you would have to probably go back in terms of history. Good morning. Um, and, and it's probably difficult to completely rule that out. Um, so we have to bear that in mind. Um, now, someone asked about family history, and constitutional delay in puberty is as a possibility, and, the, and again, the tests would look similar, much more common in boys than in girls. So, you know, and in boys is often a family history. Uh, very embarrassing, took my son to the uh, <coughs> paediatric endocrinologist, didn't realise that we had a family history. So sometimes it's, um, it's quite important to ask other people when they got their periods, whatever. So all of those are possibilities and the tests are pretty much the same. So what would we do in that setting? So probably at 17, it's getting very late for constitutional delay. We didn't really get a clear history that she was stressed and not eating properly and had weight loss, but we can't completely exclude hypothalamic amenorrhea. So in that setting, we'd probably cover all our bases, get a nutritional assessment, try and improve her weight, decrease her exercise, make sure she's eating liberally and widely, but also start some pubertal induction, and that of course would be a specialist field to do that. And, and then if it's constitutional delay, usually you can stop, in, in a girl you're given oestrogen, and in a boy you're given low-dose testosterone. Six months later, that seems to kickstart if it's constitutional delay. As I say, at 17 it's quite late, but what we don't have a test is to distinguish between the constitutional delay and a congenital lesion. So you just have to manage it. So that would be a way of covering the bases in, in, that, in that setting. Now, let's move on to prolactin problems, which I think are, are very common in, in primary care. Um, I think we're doing more prolactin measurements and we're getting a lot more slightly abnormal prolactin problems. So here's Olivia, um, and she presents with oligomenorrhea. So she's known to have PCOS, and she's got a clear-cut uh, PCOS, PCO morphology on her scan, so not just the morphology, the follicles, but note I've said the ovaries are big. Okay, so that important um, combination. No mass symptoms or signs, got a bit of acne, is very stressed. Why have I emphasized stress? Anyone know that? In terms of, as a hint, prolactin. <laughs> what does stress do to your prolactin? Yeah, okay, so that can be someone who just hates having blood tests, but also someone who is stressed might increase their prolactin a little bit. I've said no medications, and again, why is that important in this setting? Yep, lots of medications, and, and it can be quite subtle. Someone's taken something for their bowel, someone's taken something for their migraine, you know. A lot of patients are on psychotropic drugs, and most of those have at least a mild effect on prolactin. So that's, that's important. Um, so we do some tests. Um, 
She's got a slightly elevated testosterone. Um, we know she's got PCOS. Her gonadotrophins are pretty unremarkable and certainly her FSH is not raised, so we've ruled out POI. Estrogen sort of mid-range and she's got an annoying level of prolactin, which is not a clear-cut prolactinoma, but it's just slightly elevated and you do it several times. Um, the rest of the pituitary function seems very normal. So what do we do from this point? And this comes up, we get referrals like this almost every day that we consult. Now, a prolactin series, we do that in our, in our um, endocrine lab, but in fact, it's just simply putting a butterfly needle in, taking a prolactin, so if there's stress with the, with the, with the needling, the prolactin might be high, and then using the butterfly in situ to take a couple more prolactins at intervals. So the stressed patient with the blood test, prolactin will then drop. And that is a sneaky way that endocrinologists might avoid doing any more testing. So if we, we do our best to normalise the prolactin, we might send the patient, if you can't do that, you might send the patient back for another couple more prolactin measurements, asking them to be very relaxed. Um, one of my patients, GP, had been very smart and had actually said, look look and see if you've got any Valium in the cupboard, get your husband to take you up, take a Valium sort of before, the, before the test and lie down and have your blood test and see if we can normalise it. Um, this patient the problem was, did we have to do a pituitary MRI? This patient didn't want a pituitary MRI, had both PCOS and stress as possible causes for this very mild elevation. And this is actually one of my patients. Um, and she didn't want to have an MRI um, and um, she was getting some periods, although they were infrequent. So what we said is we'll monitor the prolactin and see what direction it's going in. And she decided she was very well, dropped out of review. Luckily, we did write to her GP and point this out, but they were all pretty relaxed. Three years later, comes in with a visual field abnormality and has a pituitary adenoma. This is one of mine. So, yep. Okay. So, confounders. Well, we've discussed about when to measure, probably f trying to do it in the morning, but a little bit after waking, fasting and unstressed. And as I say, it is sometimes, uh, you might have some better ideas about how to make your patient less stressed if they get worried about blood tests. Try and avoid the measurement after exercise. Don't worry about low levels. We're not thinking that diagnoses anything. And be aware of the patient who's had a recent anaesthetic. S some reason the, the here we go. The anaesthetists love to do a prolactin, so check it again. Um, these medications that are common, that can certainly... So I've had a couple from the pituitary surgeon ready to operate, and in fact the patient hadn't told them that they'd seen the gastroenterologist and started, you know, on um, medications that affect dopamine. And probably PCOS puts it up a little bit. It is one of those controversial and debatable areas. And we don't know whether we should blame PCOS for some of it. So at least give it some assessment. Now, this is just a way, an, a, a, a mnemonic for you to just sort of remember pregnancy, of course, will put your prolactin up. So always think about that. Renal failure, liver failure. Uh, the birth control pill will put it up a little bit and various other medications. Um, chest wall disease, I guess that's pretty rare, but perhaps in the setting after cardiac surgery. Um, thyroid disease, hypothyroidism, um, obviously if someone's breastfeeding. Although interestingly with breastfeeding, the prolactin's up for the first month or two and then it actually drops really down pretty much to normal and, breast and lactation is maintained then after that by sort of mechanical um, stimulation on the breast. And of course, prolactin can be up not because you've got a prolactin secreting lesion in your pituitary, but because you've got a non-functioning adenoma pressing on the stalk, controlling the inhibitor to prolactin. Okay, and that, that's what this patient had, that very mild elevation with a non-functioning adenoma, just giving that slight elevation. And of course, all those other reasons. <coughs> So when to investigate and when to refer, I think very important to be clear, clinically are there any mass signs or symptoms? Mm. How high is the prolactin? What are the periods doing? So the patient whose periods are absolute, absolutely rock solid, it's pretty hard to imagine that there's a serious prolactin problem. There is in fact a condition where there is um, biochemically active prolactin. It's called macroprolactin and many or some laboratories around New Zealand can, can measure that and differentiate that from biologically active prolactin. So that's a patient whose prolactin level might be elevated. The lab do this test and tell you that the true prolactin is actually normal and there's a lot of, if you like, this crud 
floating around in the system and that was the patient in the old days who had regular periods but a high prolactin and we just had to assume that they had this macro prolactin. Now, is there a level that you could say they can't have a pituitary lesion? And we've all worked sort of, we used to work on perhaps a level of a thousand. We would image someone whose prolactin level was over a thousand. And that was in the setting where our prolactin, the upper limit of prolactin in our laboratory was perhaps 600 or 650. In Auckland, it's dropped. The normal level is now, I think, is it? 500? 450, yep. So, but in fact, because we've all had the occasional patient creep through with a non-functioning adenoma, it's it's probably hard to say that there is a definite level you can say yay or nay. You need to look at the patient more widely in terms of these other things, particularly the mass symptoms and what's happening to the menstrual cycle. So a patient who's had regular periods and whose periods have stopped will become very erratic. Um, headaches and visual symptoms are uncommon and who's got a prolactin elevation, probably that's a patient that needs more work up to be, just to be certain. So I've, I've put down, if you like, the red flags, menstrual irregularity, and obviously visual field disturbance, other pituitary dysfunction, and without obviously being able to explain the prolactin elevation in another way. So just in terms of conclusions, um, just uh, we've, I think we've certainly emphasised when, pu when puberty should start, when there should be periods. Um, I think when you don't have a diagnosis for the cause of the amenorrhea, that would be a reason for referral. Um, testosterone levels are very variable in the assay, but certainly if you've got a high level, more than five or six, you have to start thinking about tumours, and that would be an indication for referral, or a patient who is virilised. So you know the difference between androgen excess symptoms, acne, oily skin, maybe some female pattern balding, um, male pattern hair and virilization. Virilization when people are losing breast tissue, developing more muscle mass, developing clitoromegaly, okay, and, and very severe and rapid onset of, um, of the androgen excess symptoms. So anything like that would, would, um, would be a reason for referral and obviously if you had persistent hyperplactinemia and you didn't have a cause for that.